Hello, everyone. Uh, very warm welcome to all the attendees present here and to our hosts for the day. So I won't waste much time. We'll just quickly give a brief idea about the agenda for today and a brief introduction about the speaker himself. Today, we are going to talk about financial frauds and the role of internal controls in preventing frauds. And here we have Manish Kaushik uh, with over 13 years of experience. He is an experienced advisory manager with a demonstrated history of working in management consulting industry. He is skilled in enterprise risk management, risk management and financial analysis and is currently working as a director at KPMG India. Welcome Manish. I shall be sharing my screen and would like to hand over the session to you. Thanks a lot Aditi and welcome everyone. Thanks for taking out time. Before we start as as Aditi said I'm going to but still, I'm going to, you know, introduce myself very briefly. I'm Manish Kaushik. I am a director with the firm. I've been working with the firm for about like 11 years now. It's kind of close to the entire career that I have. Previous to the firm, I was with HSBC Bank in New York. And been I've been working with the firm in CFO advisory for last 11 years. Taking out for technical advisory with respect to accounting, mergers, acquisitions. IPO listing, fundraising, as well as helping our clients from moving from one international gap to another other ones. And when India moved to IFRS, I think that's when that's when we had the most work in that sense. So that's 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 brief about me. I am a chartered accountant by profession and a bachelor in computer applications as well. So that's a that's 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 a combo that I have. With respect to what we're going to cover today as Aditi kind of mentioned, is around financial fraud and how internal controls are useful with respect to preventing that fraud. Now, before we begin the session, I would like to, to kind of, you know, set some ground rules for the session. I think unless and until you guys interact and ask questions, it's, it's, it's for your own benefit. The most you will learn is by discussing and interacting with respect to the topics we are going to cover. So I would urge all of you to be as interactive, raise questions. All what you need to do is raise questions and discuss. Rest of it is on me to, you know, make sure that, you know, we have enough discussions around those topics so that you understand them in depth. So I'm going to start by just saying that, you know, there are a few words on the screen and before we jump onto the slides, I would like to know what all of you generally understand when we say the word fraud. So you can type in and we can quickly have a look at those. What's the first word that comes to your mind when we say fraud? Okay, we got nothing in the knowledge of management. We have money laundering. What, what else? Unethical manipulation, personal gain, cheating, illegal, misappropriation, misrepresentation, fantastic, doing something malicious to get monetary gain. Okay, very good. Embezzlement of cash, yes. Okay. So I think I think I think all of us have a fair understanding of what. Cheat fund companies doubling money. I mean, this uh, team leading. Okay, very good. I think we can we can discuss these in our Q and A session as well. Some of some of these are very unique and uh, worth discussing as well when we take the Q and A at the end of it. So as of now, I think we all, as I said, I think we all have a fair understanding of what a fraud you know, sounds like and, and what we have heard generally. I think some of you, some of you kind of did talk about with respect to monetary gains. I think, I think that as, as a base, we all understand that if someone is gaining something in an, as someone also mentioned in an unethical manner, it is something that we can call as fraud. Okay. Now there are two or there are various types of frauds actually. But I think what we're going to focus on is financial fraud. I think when we say financial fraud, it, it just doesn't mean that it is just money that we're talking about. Okay, I think I think that's that's the basic we need to 
you know understand that it's not just the cash that is financial only it can be it can be property as well it can be anything with respect to which can be which has monetary value to it that is financial insider trading is is obviously not allowed but it it is not directly a fraud as such we will we will come to that i will i will explain some of these differences as well with respect to as i was saying with respect to financial frauds can so it is it is basically not just cash or not just money it can be anything else that has value attached to it as well it can be a financial fraud now do you think finance frauds or financial frauds specifically are only with respect to personal front so say for example i have i have a couple of friends uh, not just friends i'll say so say for example i'll give you an example say manish kaushik uh, tells someone that you know i can i can double your money in like 5 days okay I, i take their money and i run away like some of one of you said that you know doubling money and and cheat of cheat fund entities right or say for example i have an entity which i have incorporated wherein i am the equity shareholder or the or the single loan equity shareholder of 100% and i take money from that entity and buy something for myself okay now which do you think both of them are financial frauds or both of them differ in some way i'll repeat myself there are two set of scenarios one is where manish you know went ahead and you know solicited say for example 10 people and asked for their money and said that you know i'm going to double it in 5 days i have lots of schemes and i just took their money and ran away with it another one is manish kind of incorporated an entity ran a business through that entity but used that money that i generated from the entity because i am the whole and soul of that entity 100% owner and i used it for my personal purchases so pratham says both are financial frauds okay anyone else who has a different view <clears throat> both are frauds yes definitely both are frauds simran says first is a financial fraud they both seem to be different yes just the first one is fraudulent okay any other views actually this is exactly what what i wanted to hear first one is second one seems to be different second is misappropriation of funds okay okay bharat says second one is misappropriation of funds i'll wait for like 10 seconds more before uh, rest of you are uh, able to respond or think there is another answer to this you don't have to see what someone else may have responded whatever you feel you can respond okay so both of them are frauds okay now both of them are financial frauds as well because it involves money uh, or some other form of money now how both are different is when and that's that's where i think the difference lies and that's where Uh, the first one is a pure play cheating as well you know so i represented myself as manish kaushik i went to ask for money i went to ask for people's money took that money misrepresented myself or misrepresented the facts that were related to me the outcome that i could have created for them and that is how i was able to gain their money okay that's that's the first kind of fraud what we are going to cover and why we accountants what we need to know and how these frauds with respect to entities occur okay why it is important and why i gave this example is when we have an entity it is a separate legal entity okay but entity in itself cannot run right it's still a non touchable it's still an invisible thing you know it cannot conduct business on its own it needs people to run it for it right but even though i am the whole and soul equity owner of the entity entity is still a separate legal entity i as manish kaushik cannot use entity's money 
and that is why the second one is also a financial form but the nature is different and our focus and the way and what we are going to learn and think about and and see how internal controls can help will be the second part of it where there is an entity involved and there are people who are running the entity or have authorization or power of some sort in their hands when they misuse that power or when they neglect something as well okay then there is a fraud that happens and that is what we going to cover as part of our lab is is that clear to everyone do we understand yes absolutely absolutely the corporate wheel is is what we need to lift and only then we understand how it is an actually a fraud so is everyone clear i think i think it is clear to pratham that i can i can see if anyone has any 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 doubts or if they still don't understand i can repeat it because that that's the essence that is very important to understand how these how these frauds are natured and why do we need to understand there is an entity which we are talking about so if anyone hasn't understood uh, can just say no and if there is a no coming up in like 10 seconds i'll repeat okay then very good good group that we have so now that we understand how various frauds are different in nature okay now now what we need to understand going forward is and there is a differentiation and a definition on the screen as well now what definition generally says is it's an it may be an intentional or an unintentional act as well okay where we may use various items it can be just a lack of knowledge as well it can be deception but we use it to gain an unfair advantage okay now that is what we term and it should be there should be a value attached to it for we calling it actually a fraud now there are different types of frauds that we have discussed in entities as well now that we have understood that and we going to focus on the frauds that involve entities now can someone tell me how a private entity and a public entities people who are responsible and how those are different with respect to those frauds that may happen with them anyone can give a give a rough guess then we can so i'll repeat the question with this now that now that we have come to a conclusion that entities are the ones where we need to focus our our discussion for today how are private and public attack different with respect to frauds that can happen okay i'll 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 give it i'll i'll i'll, I'll tell you so private companies by nature are controlled by a few individuals absolutely jyoti absolutely so that's that's what i was coming to jyoti that for a private entity it is a very few individuals who control the entity okay now the money involved is also from those people only they are the equity shareholders in it now for a private entity the fraud can be in a manner wherein these people who actually control the entity uses the entity and gain unfair advantage from the third world or the third parties how does that happen so say for example i'll take all examples on me so say manish kaushik wants say 10 crore loan okay now that cannot happen just on my network okay now what i do is okay i decide boss i'll i'll float a private entity i i float a private entity i i forge a few of the invoices i get into you know fake entities and i get a number which is substantial enough for banks to allow me a loan to that entity okay now a private limited entity with those people who control it in this example manish and his friends say for example uses that entity they have incorporated that goes to the market 
and uses deception or forged documents or a picture which is not absolutely correct and gain unfair advantage from third parties. And the example that I took is the bank that I am gaining advantage from. I take those funds, utilize those funds and run away. So that's a private entity which generally uses and which, which is used to have third parties uh, done fraud with. Now for a public entity, the picture is not exactly the same. Okay, For a public entity, how, what happens in a public entity is there are investors who invest money. Okay, Investors can invest in a private entity as well, but all of those are short-lived. All of those investors are short in number and they generally own the entity. Now, when we talk about a public entity, it means their share is traded at the stock exchange. Those shareholders may be sitting all across the world. Okay, For them, it is difficult to collude and then do something. But the important part is the entity is run by different people and the money invested is from different people. And that is why the interests of those investors it is at stake. Then the fraud that generally takes place is the people who are in charge of the day-to-day -day operations or have the power to run the entity uses their position to fraud the investors of the entity and take their money and use it for their personal gains. So this is how obviously a, a public entity may enter into a fraudulent contract with third party as well. But generally and essentially when we talk about fraud, it is when investors' money is used by people that are who are in position or who are in power. So that's how a public entity uses or a public entity's money is used for a fraud case. Is that is that clear to all of us now? With respect to how a private and a public entities are different. Yes, Imra. I think I think that's that's. Yes, it is clear, I think. I think, Imran, you will get a recorded link. Yes. But I can repeat Imran as well. Or you may have to study a, a bit as well with respect to how what a private company and a, and a public company are in their essence. And then maybe it will make more sense to you. Okay, I'm getting a few yeses as well. Public company is the fraud through those charged with governance. Absolutely. So when I said... This is Deepika. So Deepika, you're absolutely correct. People who are in power, or when I say, when you say in governance is exactly, that means that they are the ones who generally, uh, you know, collude and get some fraud going because they are the people who are, who are there with respect to the, the power in position. But there are other people who can, who can, who can commit fraud in public entities. We can, we will look for some examples as well. And we will, use them in, in our discussion. But generally, with respect to a private versus public, these are the people who get into it. <laughs> okay, so I wouldn't say that any company made big fraud example while auditing by KPMG. So I wouldn't, I think, I think you, thankfully you wrote KMPG, not KPMG. Yes, Satyam was one of the cases. Okay, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of rushing with the Notes, what are the questions that we have certain public company is the fraud through those charges with governance? Yes. I think it can it, it will be difficult for an audit audit committee to uh, you know commit a fraud as such, Deepika, because audit company, audit committee is a committee that actually puts those controls in place, the internal controls that we are going to you know talk about. Audit com committee is those one of those committees that are put there as internal control so that these frauds don't take place. So it, it, it's going to be a tough scenario for an audit com committee to indulge into it because generally audit committee is comprised of people who are external to the entity and generally don't have any governing power to run the entity. Does that answer your question? Okay, hopefully, yes. Yeah. Now the next, I think, yes, I think, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go to Imran's question. So any, I think, I think Imran, there are companies who, who may have done frauds, small, big ones, but audit is just one part of it. It is not something that, you know, auditor is the only 
agency or the entity which can which can stop frauds from happening fraud is a very difficult scenario or an event that can that can be prevented now we need to prevent frauds rather than rather than you know report them auditor generally is only looking at the financials or the transactions once they have happened they may or may not be frauds in audited financial statements as well many cyber cases money fraud is happening oh absolutely absolutely i think all of those are the are like the example that i gave as a first example between manish kaushik and the entity that manish floated so those are the ones with the cyber cases money where if you see how people nowadays are you know just calling that there is a there is this web series along with that as well and i think with the name of jamata where it, like people call others and say that you know i'm stuck here or this is the qr code so it is it is it evolves right so frauds have been happening since ages since the discovery of money itself people have used deception or unethical ways to gain access to others money and it has continued the modus operandi keeps changing right bharat pe wasn't wasn't a complete fraud ajay uh, but it had but it 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 was it was used like that it wasn't just the bharat pe who was a fraud okay so there are some of the examples as well with respect to reporting now so when we are saying that there are fraudulent financial reporting it means the entity which is reporting the numbers is not reporting the correct numbers in their correct sense of what they are their balance sheet position or their financial health is they are either increasing the expenses they are either decreasing the expenses or they are kind of you know looking to increase the revenue decrease the revenue or changing some of the balance sheet items to to help them a particular scenario it may be a case wherein they are looking they are looking to have a very substantial loan from a bank for for that they need a very very strong uh, profit and loss or revenue in that sense so they may inflate their numbers in that sense exact exaggerated scales also but there can be scenarios where the entity is looking to decrease the sales as well and that also is a fraud can you tell me why an entity would like to decrease its sales everyone can like most of you would give an example of increased sales but if someone can help me a scenario why entity would decrease its sales and it's still absolutely ganendra it is with respect to tax generally absolutely absolutely right i think i think i think i will clap for for the people who answered well done so entities who are looking to reduce their sales is on account of taking an advantage with respect to taxes so what they going to pay is less taxes today okay so that that is that is also one of the frauds only in one decreasing is absolutely even if you i think generally i think who said uh, for the uh, archel so archel with respect to next quarter i think generally tax rates are similar quarter wise but they may do it to defer it to the next years definitely that is something that that they may that entities may plan and that's that's what tax evasion or tax planning can be part of it that they may decide to defer their tax payments to different years and that also is a fraud absolutely absolutely so that are some of the examples i think some of some of the examples you guys did that is there on the screen as well i think we have covered them as well planning may or may not be there is a very thin line between tax evasion and tax planning and maybe maybe if you have if you, if you think about how tax every every person plans for it i think if it is within the ambit of the law we call it planning but the moment it goes outside the ambit of the law we say it is evasion but it, it it's a very thin line between the two okay am i missing any comments da, 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 da. so some of the examples we have already talked about with respect to inventory again it's it's one of the one of the ways we increase or decrease my balance sheet strength in that sense for that year i think i think very 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 important example with respect to you know entities is will will come to will come to your questions srinivasan when we say that you know if you could tell me why 
capitalization yeah uh, yeah i think i think we are coming to that uh, pratham that if you capitalize something that had to be expended so if it had to be an expenditure but you capitalized it why would that be a fraud can anyone help help me with that i think pratham also asked the same question do you think it is overstating the profit absolutely 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 i think i think everyone gets i think we have got a good good group of people who actually understand how my how my numbers move so absolutely right so pratham i think that that's your answer if i had to expense something off and now i'm capitalizing i'm essentially reducing my expenses and i'm taking the hit of those expenses in future years and on a depreciated manner rather than giving that hit in one year i am utilizing that opportunity to capitalize the same and using depreciation as an expense over a period of life or amortization in that sense absolutely absolutely so it is i think i think what they did was a wrong accounting policy it can be a result of an a wrong accounting policy or a mistake as well not every mistake is a fraud but if you are doing it intentionally okay and it results in a, in a specific gain to someone and a loss to someone else it is a fraud it may be just a wrong accounting policy also and whether a wrong accounting policy or a wrong accounting treatment is a fraud or not that is something a point of question when that that has to be taken individually as a case but what byju's did was definitely a fraud in that sense it's not just a wrong accounting policy okay anyone else has any doubts on the few of the examples that we have whether they agree with whether they are fraud or not or else we move to the next slide i think we are already on time actually give an example of un okay unintended fraud would be so say for example you i mean that will be too difficult one so say for example there is a transaction that you entered in archal with with your uh, you purchased an item okay now you believed that this item should be expensed off you know as your accounting policy but given the new accounting standards that are there in the picture now or who are which are applicable that asset had to be capitalized okay you couldn't have expensed it off in the same year now that is something it is an unintended error in that sense okay now whether it translates it to into a fraud and someone is kind of you know duped of some money and someone can actually call it as a fraud that's a different thing but it is when you make an error that's is an in, unintended fraud okay generally to call it a fraud it should be intentional but at the same time even if you did something unintentionally but if it is still an error and someone is out there who loses money because of the information you presented okay that still counts as fraud does that answer your question so so we have got some examples uh, i think we have discussed a few examples but there are few more on the screen just to see how misappropriation of assets can also result in fraud it's kind of pretty straightforward all of them with respect to the fraud i think the base formula remains the same what we have discussed there can be million types of frauds that are available or it can be done in the financial statements so going to spend a couple of say, less than a minute maybe you can just scroll through the screen and if you believe that you don't understand one of it we can have a quick round about it else we'll move on i think we should move on to the to the internal controls that are needed for these for the prevention of these frauds from now so frauds happen right frauds happen errors happen there is a lot of things that that take place when an entity is run from a, because the people who are at the helm of control you know at, at the top of the entity which where say for example i am the director of the entity and and i am responsible for a smooth functioning of the entity i cannot as a as personally i i don't think i can control everything that the entity does so i personally may not be able to you know stop every fraud 
So what entities can do, because there are a lot of people to control, then we put processes into it. Okay. We put processes into my, my roles, responsibilities, and the way my entity functions or my company functions so that there are like negligible or no chances of someone doing a misappropriation or using entity's money or someone else's money for their own personal gain. Okay. Now, all of those processes put together as such is generally what we call as internal controls. Okay. Now, every entity based upon their level of operations, their scope of operations, their in what countries they are, what kind of methodology you use, how many people are involved in it, will have different levels of internal control. Okay. Now, some of the entities may only have preventive controls in, in place. You know, what, what do we mean by preventive? Or say, let, let's just first take the example of a detective one. So some of the entities may only have detective controls. Okay. Some may have a corrective and some may have preventive as well. They have, there may be a combination of all of them or one by one. Now entities which are smaller, you know, which are small in size, which have less money to spend because the processes or putting in the processes and their design implementation and maintenance of the same also involves a cost around. It, okay. So some of these entities may just have a detective control out. Okay. Now they may say that like an audit, I gave you an example, right? That, okay, may, may the fraud may have happened, but we are okay to only detect it later on. Okay. And put processes around it that once I have detective, once I have detected the problem, then I put the corrective measures into place. Now, some of the entities may think otherwise and they may feel that, okay, no, we need to prevent it as much as possible. So they may put processes into place to prevent the frauds itself. Okay. So internal controls is all the processes that are there to prevent such mishappenings, safeguarding the assets, applicable rules and regulations are followed. There is, there is negligible or no chance of someone else utilizing someone else's money or gaining from the information that that may have. So all of that put together are the internal controls. And again, various entities may utilize detective or preventive measures to actually control all of these frauds. But once they have detective, whatever processes they change or put into place as new processes, are the corrective measures that they take. So that's the general internal controls for every aspect, sorry, for every aspect of a change in internal control or every aspect of a fraud that happens, every case that happens, entity may put corrective measures. In. If they can foresee what can happen, they may be able to put a preventive uh, process to it, but if they can't, they will have to put detective and corrective one. Okay. Now, can you give me a few examples of internal controls? The Generally, the frauds that we discussed as examples, what controls you would put to them to prevent them or say correct them later on as well? Clear delignation. MIS. Okay. So, I am assuming, Srinivasan, you mean that there should be a maker checker, like the responsibilities of who does what is absolutely clear. Fair enough. And when you say MIS, it means that proper reporting of the transactions that have happened so that someone can review them and can take preventive measures or corrective measures if needed. Yes, absolutely right, Pratham. I think I think authorization is, is very, very important. And I think someone else with respect to delegation as well. Delegation involves authorization as well. So it's absolutely important. Absolutely, it helps. When different people have different authorization levels, it helps to control the quantum of that needs to be evaluated. We, we discussed a lot of examples of fraud. So for every fraud, there has to be one way to prevent it as well. No? Stopping inside the trading, no one should be there. Yes, Shibangi, absolutely right. 
and insider trading is diff kind of pretty company secrets obviously there could be different to insider trading as well but yes absolutely right we shouldn't share anything that is private to that entity whistleblower policies should be there system controls is a very good very very good uh, response shrinivas because i think systems control is important because most of it is not manual nowadays it is driven through systems so if you if we have proper systems that are there and the controls associated with it there is lesser chance of people able to you know gain advantage out of it absolutely right an exception reporting is also fantastic answer it is difficult i think i think ganendra with respect to insider trading it is it is very difficult but at the same time i think what we discussed about uh, with respect to delegation and people who actually need to know that stuff only they know it they know about it and information educating them that you know how an insider trading happens what they should be careful about and how they should report absolutely vigil mechanism is also part of it how they should report it and how they should be keeping that information to themselves and how that impacts the company if that information goes out what they are talking about and how it impacts them as well some of the people don't even know what can be the repercussions of an insider trading right so those the education those trainings if you see public public entities put a lot of focus on you know putting or imparting trainings to their employees especially finance employees who who understand numbers who are closer to the numbers for these insider trading so training putting these policies in place telling them a proper procedure of how to report these things and making them understand how it impacts the entity as well as themselves as individually you know ratios also absolutely this is a mechanism with respect to mis itself when you prepare mis when you have various information management reports that are available you review them and you see and look for exceptions as you also mentioned you look for abnormalities abnormalities you look for exceptions and then you see where, what are what are the reasons behind those exceptions absolutely then we've got a good sense of what you know these examples uh, should be and that is basically the examples what we could have i think we we as a group have kind of surpassed way better than what is there on the screen so as kudos to us and mainly to you guys so we got i think i think we we have a, a case study which we built on enron as such i think some of you already uh, talked about satyam and some of the other scams enron arthur was a very old but it kind of shook the entire industry with respect to accounting and audit as well so i think that is something that we have primarily that happened with Ar enron and arthur was that the new cfo that was that was appointed uh, for this entity utilized a lot of his personal connections as off balance sheet partnerships and he siphoned a lot of money and also they uh, used what we call as mark to market technique wherein we say that you know whatever gains are there they kind of pulled their gains unrealized gains what we call and put their in, in put them in their current pnl so that their current profits are inflated and in addition to that as i said they had a lot of off balance sheet partnership they where they siphoned of money where money was actually not there and auditors also kind of were part of it and arthur anderson which was the audit entity with them they kind of all were there and it was it was a huge shock to the to the entire financial you know hub or i say the fraternity in that sense a lot of these people went to jail as well for their fraud that they had committed after this only i think i think the biggest change that happened was with respect to internal controls and the strictness of the same for the listed entities and then what they were called sarbanes oxley which we call socks uh, now there are various versions of it as well indian companies act itself is a string more stringent and a stricter version of socks itself that also is a commendable act with respect to indian governance which kind of you know runs this show they did a fantastic job with companies act it is it is it is few steps ahead of socks but the socks was the ask at that time and 
and a lot a lot of lot of lot of lot of frauds have happened but if you generally see most of these policies and things that come out of picture are after a fraud has happened most of them are able to put only corrective measures rather than preventive so there are there are a lot of lot of scams that have happened some of you also mentioned there was a very good if if you are like you know keen to read there was a fraud with respect to the uh, libor itself wherein yes absolutely sebi came after sebi sebi as an entity itself after came that uh, came in into effect after that scam it was there sebi was there to some extent in in different forms it wasn't called sebi but yes in its full force it is still yet to come but i think companies act when when it when it came in i think is is a is is a way, very good step uh, with respect to governing uh, indian entities which are listed and i was saying with respect to libor when bank of england itself kind of you know rigged the libor with with the collusion colluding with some of the uh, you know really big banks i think you should you should read about that as well which hit the uk and the us entities a lot uh, i think few years back so that also is and what what rbs rbs did was also also something you you can you can you can read through with respect to how the balance sheets were inflated and actually they had nothing while they reported they were the strong or like one of the strongest banks so that that they were hit by 45 billion kind of loss right away like the 45 billion of billion of net worth wiped off yes lehman brothers again was a very good example so there are millions like you know as i said since the since the inception of money itself you know frauds have been happening and they i would kind of you know put myself on the line and say they will keep happening because people will keep thinking about new ways to you know the modus operandi will keep changing but i think as as accountants and regulators who are there their first job is to see how they can prevent something and if not prevent definitely once once case has happened they should be able to detect it and then put corrective measures and that is why we as accountants should be able to contribute for the entities that we are working for actually <laughs> that's a very kind of you know a question that so in my personal opinion i would say i would say i wouldn't say that there are a lot a, a very huge percent of them are you know doing frauds you know fraud is something very very serious in that sense they may be you know uh, trying to see how they can get more business i think that era has also passed initially when startups started uh, i think everyone was running towards the top line the revenues only they did a lot of lot of lot of efforts around just looking at revenues only now that wasn't fraud in that sense but they some of them used different techniques and at that time given the accounting standard that was there they used those as well to see how their top line can be increased but i i, I don't think i have a percentage in my in my in my head like that to you know say that you know what percentage would be doing frauds but but i'm sure all of them all of them are under pressure and will always be under pressure to perform and and that that's that that's that's the beauty of startups as well you know okay so that's that kind of brings us to the to the end of what we wanted to discuss with respect to frauds and internal controls though we have been discussing questions uh, while on the go as well but i'm happy to take others as well aditi all of it is what what i explained with respect to enron so you can keep i think i think we are done with this yeah so if you have any any more questions for me with respect to what we have discussed or with respect to the course itself or, or something else we are happy to frequently kpmg conducts these type of programs so when you say these type of programs is it just this one with respect to fraud what we discussed for last an hour or so or the program that we are running as masters it is just pretty frequent uh, we are running this with masters union and we we do it pretty frequently skew one thing what's the scope of frm should go for it absolutely absolutely yaar yeah. why not i think i think with respect to scope i think given given the change given given the speed at which we are changing with respect to finance i think everything is in great demand 
there is nothing that I can think of where there is no demand about, including FRM, as you said. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, you should go for it. Whatever you do, whatever you pick up, I think do it in depth. Do it in depth. Have an absolute masterclass on it. Be absolutely sure what you are doing. I think you will. everything has very good scope. I don't see anything that is struggling as of now as, a, as in, in finance space. How do fund managers get in for work? Tough. I think, I, think, I think fund managers also get, they keep asking for these, you know, regular reports from the uh, investing entities. They keep looking at the audit reports. Obviously, they have to rely upon various, various entities like auditors, the uh, due diligence that they keep on doing on those entities, you know, various reports that they keep asking and then reconciling their own reviews and the discussions with directors itself. So that, that's how they, they keep keep an eye on it. There is a concept of uh, forensics audit as well nowadays. Whenever, not just the fund managers, anyone who has enough share or enough investment in that entity can look for a forensics audit. KPMG also does the same. And then the entire entity is run across a forensics audit, a frauds audit in that sense. And then you try and look for these areas where frauds might have happened. So there is a specific audit for that as well. What led me to finance? Okay. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a long story. I'll cut it short. I had science till graduation. I had started my physics honors. But then my, my dad had an idea to look, tell me that I should do CA and then accounting. So uh, that's to my dad, actually. Thank you for joining as well. Are you classify industry specific frauds? Uh, I think the question I'm not clear. Are you saying, can we classify industry specific frauds? If Yeah, okay. I think, I think absolutely, absolutely. So there would be industries wherein, a, obviously, because even for a fraud to happen, there has to be some basics that are needed. So there would be a means to it when you can actually plan and do that to do that fraud. That would be specific to those industries. Yes, absolutely. See a necessity to get into forensics auditing? Absolutely not. But with respect to financial, not just CA, I would say it's not just CA, but to actually understand financial statements and to go for a, because forensics audit is not only with respect to financial statements only, okay? It is a lot of other things as well. So say, for example, procurement, you know, when you go for procurement, there may be a fraud there as well, where in, assuming I am the procurement manager, I ask for three quotes, but all of those quotes are my own entities, you know, then, then that is also a fraud, right? For that, you don't need to be a CA, you don't need to uh, do that. But for financial statements, fraud and items which are very, very specific to those, yes, you may need some sort of uh, financial knowledge for that. Yes. So then I have failed. Is it perfect? In the masters. No, absolutely, absolutely. And and I think I think you should you should focus. Keep focusing on what you're studying as well. It is a tough course. There is no doubt about it. There is a lot of variables that get into uh, someone passing the course as well. Keep doing the hard work and you can, you, you should, you should try and do the masters as well so that it helps you understand some of the concepts as well. Okay. I also, after completing was guy in three years, we're going to start it for CA studies. <laughs> Good Jyoti. I didn't, I didn't complete. I completed my graduation in, in, in computers actually. And by that time I had, I, I was in CAP2 as well. So long, 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 long time back. Is the course will help us do fraud or prevent fraud. <laughs> I hope you don't use it to do fraud, but to prevent and correct. Or obviously it's up to you how to utilize it. Roadmap to become an investment banker. Investment banker is is very different field to what what uh, we are as of now. I think it's it's the MBAs and and other things that you may have to think about and go for them uh, to be an investment banker as such. It has nothing to do with fraud or non fraud or preventive fraud, and it's an absolutely different field. Guarantee. Okay, we are at eight two. Maybe we'll 
take a couple more minutes for you guys to ask questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. And you're welcome to question us later as well if you have more questions. Any specific certification other than MBA in finance? Or there are a few with respect to, uh, if, if specifically you're talking about an investment banking, there are a few work in financial company. I think there are there is a basic requirement of you should have a graduation, whether if it's if you have a higher degree in finance, that works. If not, then there are various courses available like ours itself, which you can join that should help you get into a financial entity. I mean, do you get a certificate that I will let Manisha or Aditi or Nandita answer? Manisha, do we get a certificate? Can you suggest the tips to crack interviews in Big Four? I think, I think there will be a session. I think I think in a masterclass there is a session where you help you with how to you know present how how to go about interviews and how to prepare for them and other things. Yes, Deepika, and there will be some tips in there. Yes, is any placement in other countries? Uh, if your question is with respect to this this class that a placement in other countries itself. Yeah, Aditi, you're there. Aditi, do we get a certificate? About the course, then definitely it's a certificate program. You do get a certificate towards the end of like 12 months, which is the duration of the course. But I'm not sure about the particular masterclass if you're mentioning that. Okay. Harini, that, I hope that answers your question. Can you suggest the tips? Is there placement? So when we, so in the placements that we are offering, Aditi, is there, I don't think that the placements are other than India, right? FRM or CFO, both are good, yeah. So it's not that like it's a huge pool of opportunities abroad, but okay, cool, Harini. Thanks. We'll be waiting for that session. Okay, Shivangi, there will be a time. Okay, so Aditi has shared a link with all of you. Go to that. Read about the master camp. So again, I think you should should we close Aditi? Yeah, sure. All the Go questions on. I feel have been answered. We can close it. Cool. So I'll say thank you very much, everyone. And a fantastic group to have. I think you all were very, very interactive. And thank you for your time again. Mm -hmm.